Let's bring in the Senator Marco Rubio from Florida, the vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee. Senator Rubio, thanks for joining us this morning. You were on that Zoom yesterday with President Zelensky. Are you and your colleagues now more open to a no-fly zone? You know, the, the look, a no-fly zone has become a catchphrase. I'm not sure a lot of people fully understand what that means. That means flying AWACS 24 hours a day. That means the willingness to shoot down and engage Russian airplanes in the sky. That means, frankly, you can't put those planes up there unless you're willing to knock out the anti-aircraft uh, systems that the Russians have deployed, and not just in Ukraine, but in Russia and also in, in, in Belarus. So basically, a no-fly zone, it, uh, if people understood what it means, it means World War III. It means starting World War III. So I think there are a lot of things we can do to help Ukraine protect itself, both from airstrikes and missile strikes. But I think the people need to understand what a no-fly zone means. It's not just, it's not some rule you pass that everybody has to oblige by. It's the willingness to shoot down the aircrafts of the Russian Federation, which is basically the beginning of World War III. How about this provision of fighter jets? We would provide the fighter jets to Poland, other Eastern European nations. They would send the jets they now have to Ukraine. Do you support that? I do. If that can be done, that would be great. Uh, I do have concerns about a couple things, and that is sort of, uh, you know, can they actually fly them, given the amount of anti-aircraft capabilities that the Russians possess um, uh, and, and continue to have deployed in the region. By the way, yesterday was a terrible day for the Russian Air Force. They're losing. They don't have air control either there. But th generally speaking, it's something I'd be supportive of, and, and we should do what we can to help them. The president has resisted banning Russian oil imports. Of course, that would send gas prices soaring even more here in this country. Do you support it? I do, and I don't think, you know, I think that's something that you can construct a plan to phase that in uh, pretty rapidly, and you could use reserves for the purposes of buffering that. But we have more than enough ability in this country to produce enough oil to make up for the, the percentage that we buy from Russia. And, uh, and by the way, this notion that somehow banning Russian oil would raise prices on American consumers is an admission that this guy, that this killer, that this butcher, Vladimir Putin, has leverage over us. Why would we want that leverage to continue? Why, why would we have someone like him to have the power to raise gas prices on Americans, which is basically, if he cuts us off, what would happen in the reverse? So I think we have enough of it. We should produce more American oil and buy less Russian oil or none, actually none at all. You're facing some criticism from fellow legislators for tweeting out a picture of President Zelensky during his Zoom with Congress yesterday. The ambassador asked members not to do that because it would endanger Zelensky. Why did you ignore that request? First of all, she said that well into the call. Second, there's no security risk in that at all. I mean, perhaps she was under the impression that the Zoom call was a secret. It had been broadly reported, like multiple outlets, maybe even ABC had tweeted it was at 9.30. There were over 300 people on this call. The details of the call were emailed to a bunch of people. And, and it was a nondescript picture, unlike any of the other ones, just like the other ones you've seen on the air. So uh, th there's no security risk there. You don't believe you put him at risk? No. I want to also bring up something that one of your fellow Republicans, Senator Lindsey Graham, has repeated again yesterday. Earlier in the week, he called for Russians to assassinate uh, Vladimir Putin. Was that responsible? Well, look, people are watching what's happening in Ukraine and, and what this man is doing to these people, what this monster is doing to human beings, and they're very angry about it. And, and obviously, you know, at the end of the day, I, I do think Vladimir Putin's going to face some problems internally in Russia. Um, how the Russians seek to take care of it is, is up to them. I, I'm not sure he was calling for a U.S. action in that regard. I think what he was basically trying to say, at least my reading of it, is I wish someone would take this guy out and remove him from power one way or the other. I think the whole world wishes that. But that's not something we can impose. That's something that has to happen organically. It has to happen internally. And, and, and maybe it will, because he's not just facing a military catastrophe in Ukraine where he really can't win. I mean, the two outcomes he has before him are a costly military victory followed by a costly long-term occupation or a quagmire, but he's also facing a second front at home where his economy is headed to third world status here pretty rapidly. So far, he appears completely undeterred by that. Do you believe he's acting in a rational manner? I think he's acting in a manner he believes is rational because you have to understand this is a guy who views himself as a historic figure. He's, he believes his legacy is going to be secured by being the person that restored great Russia. You can't be a greater Russia without Ukraine under your thumb. And that's what he's pursuing now. I also believe that he's a person that cannot, he cannot survive, for example, being humiliated and he can't survive in power 
if it looks like he backed down to NATO. So I think that creates a real opportunity here for danger. I don't think his perceptions are the same as our, we, we, our perceptions about the world, about uh, the way things are going and so forth. This guy's also an authoritarian leader. He doesn't get a lot of bad news. They don't report a lot of bad news to him because it didn't get you promoted. So um, I, I, I unfortunately think we're entering probably the most dangerous part of this conflict. Uh, because as he begins to realize he can't make the tactical gains on the ground that he wants to make, I think he's willing to escalate and do things that, um, unfortunately, would be pretty cataclysmic. It feels like a real dilemma. You say that Putin can't win this war, but he also seems pretty determined not to lose. So what can we do? Well, that's one of the great challenges of these moments. I think there are, if you look throughout history, there are times when you reach points like this. Right where there doesn't seem to be an easy way out, and and I hope I'm wrong. I hope I wake up tomorrow and read that there's been this great negotiation and peace is here, and there's people are going to be able to get humanitarian aid, and the shelling is going to stop. Uh, but that's what my heart hopes for. But my mind, what I know about this man, and know about Russia, and know about its intentions, and know about history, tells me we got some ways to go yet until we reach a point like that, and it may not, and it's not going to be a pretty, uh, it's not going to be a pretty journey to that point. Um, there are not a lot of good options here right now, unfortunately. Senator Rubio, thanks very much for your time this morning. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.